Hello and welcome back to chapter 5. This is the third lecture video for this chapter of OpenStax Astronomy, uh, and this is one of the most important chapters in the book. So for this particular video, we are going to talk about the structure of an atom, and a lot of what's in that first section uh, should be familiar to us from high school science, but it's fine if it isn't, that's why it's here, so that we make sure that we're all on the same page. And then we're going to get into something new to our astronomy curriculum, which is how spectral lines, which we mentioned briefly in the previous video, how those lines are formed. So to make sure that we all start this um, topic on the same understanding, we start on the same page, is to go back to what should have been in high school chemistry, but maybe that was something that we didn't quite learn the first time, or maybe it's been so long that we don't remember it, all perfectly fine. The key parts that we need to know is that an atom is made up of two main components, a inner dense mass-filled nucleus and an outer electron cloud, which has a lot of details in chemistry that we don't care about for our particular curriculum, but we do need to know that the electrons are separated from the nucleus. So in the nucleus, the massive central part of the atom is where we can find all of the protons and the neutrons in an atom. And we'll be talking about in the next couple of slides the number of protons and the number of neutrons affect how we think of atoms and what we call them, and we'll be talking about that. And then electrons are outside of the nucleus, and they are far away from the nucleus um, on kind of atom uh, size scales. If we were to think of the nucleus as a little tiny um, grape seed, something very small that we could put on a massive area like a football field, we would actually need two football fields to get out to where the electron cloud is. So an atom is actually mostly empty space, and any drawing that we see, including the ones in our slides, are going to be vastly not to scale. Now it's important to recognize that protons have a positive charge and electrons have a negative charge. Opposite charges attract, and so the electrons are bound to the atom because they're basically feeling a pull towards the protons. But in a similar way to the fact that the Earth orbits the Sun because there is this mutual pull of gravity, electrons kind of orbit the nucleus because there is this mutual pull of this um, electric force. Now atoms are the smallest possible sample of a chemical element. And if you've ever seen the periodic table, and hopefully, hopefully you have before this class, but you're welcome to kind of revisit pictures on, um, online, all of the different elements in the periodic table have different names because they contain a different number of protons from each other. The total number of protons in the nucleus of an atom determines what element we call that atom. All hydrogen atoms have one proton total. If there were two instead, it would be a helium atom instead. If, for example, there were six protons in the nucleus, we would have a carbon atom, and so on. The two pictured here, we can kind of use that list to help us name. On the left, we have a single proton in the middle, so that is hydrogen. And on the right, we have two protons and two neutrons, Although there are four total things, the part that determines the name is the protons. Because there are two of them, we have a helium atom. Now the nucleus of an atom almost always contains neutrons as well. The, the lone exception is hydrogen, which is stable on its own with a single proton. But once you have more than one proton in a nucleus, you need uh, neutrons for stability. Now, the number of neutrons actually has an effect on how we think of a particular atom. Two atoms that have the same number of protons would be the same element, but if they have different number of neutrons, then they would be different versions of that element, and that different versioning is called isotopes. Now, hydrogen isotopes are common enough in the universe to be given names separate from just hydrogen 1, hydrogen 2, and hydrogen 3. They're shown here on the bottom of the slide, and we won't really get into them in great detail, 
But when we say hydrogen, in general, we are talking about the most common form, the most common version or most common isotope of hydrogen, which is a single proton by itself. Now, deuterium is going to show up in our discussion of how stars power themselves and our discussion eventually of brown dwarfs and what those are, as well as if we ever hear the term heavy water, that's molecules that are made up of the specific isotope of hydrogen that has two total things in the nucleus, one proton and one neutron. And then tritium is even less common than the previous two, and it's used in some lab applications like lasers, but we won't be getting into that in our course. Okay, so the num number of protons determines what we call an atom, what element it is in the periodic table, and the number of neutrons determines what version of that element we're talking about, the isotope. So if we hear about carbon-12 compared to carbon-14, the carbon part tells us we know how many protons are there, six, although we don't have to memorize that. And the 12 versus 14 is telling us the total number of things in the nucleus. So carbon-12 has six neutrons plus the six protons, and carbon-14 has eight neutrons plus the six protons. Okay, so let's get back to electrons then. The number of them has to tell us something, and it does. It tells us the overall charge of the atom. And we can ionize an atom by giving it extra electrons or taking away some electrons, and that's important to be aware of. And it's something that we would have learned in high school chemistry, but it's actually not what astronomers care the most about when we start to think about electrons. Instead, what astronomers care the most about is the fact that electrons are able to change their, we can say, location relative to the nucleus, basically how far away from the nucleus on average that they are, which gives them places to be that contains different amounts of energy. Now, we're going to see throughout this class uh, the simple model called the Bohr model for an atom which works perfectly fine for hydrogen and conveniently for us. That's the most common element in the universe. But once we start to get into more detailed atoms, the Bohr model really breaks down in how we can use it to visualize things. So we do want to be aware that it's a very simplified model for us to use, but it's a helpful model in our particular circumstances. So we can kind of think of the electrons as orbiting at a certain distance if we draw concentric circles. And the further away that quote-unquote orbit is, the more energy it contains. But it is best to remember that the way that chemists tend to think about this, and the way that we'll also see briefly in our slides, is that we're talking about energy levels, where if we go further up a ladder, we have more energy, and if we are further down the ladder, we have less energy. The interesting and important thing for us is each individual element has its own ladder, basically, its own set of where those energy levels are, how they are spaced relative to each other. And what that ends up telling us then is that each atom has its own spectral fingerprint. So in this section, section 5.5 of the book, we are going to try to understand where these spectral lines are coming from because of that ladder of energy levels. So for a particular element, we can think of these energy levels uh, with numbers. N equals 1 is the ground state. That's worth writing down. N equals 1, the lowest energy level, is called the ground state. It will show up in a slide or two. And all of these higher energy levels are excited states. Now, electrons are able to change their energy level. They're able to go up the ladder or down the ladder but they do that by emitting or absorbing energy in the form of photons. So if an electron is sitting somewhere in the, um, somewhere in the atom and a photon comes by and it is absorbed by the electron, let's say the electron takes a cup of coffee and drinks it all, now it has a whole lot more energy, it's able to jump up to a higher energy level and when we say up, all we mean is farther away from the nucleus. It has more energy than it did before. 
Now, the key thing is that electrons are able by themselves to jump back down to a lower energy level, but they have to emit a photon. They have to get rid of that extra energy somehow, and so they get rid of it by sending off a photon, a piece of light. So this slide, if you need to pause the video to write down these um, key ideas, it is a really important one for us to understand. We'll be working with it as we go through, but the key part is that absorption and emission are based on how electrons move about a particular atom. And it is only when a photon's energy matches exactly the jump from one energy level to a different energy level that it will actually be absorbed by the electron to make that motion. Because if we imagine this as an actual ladder, you can't rest your foot in between two rungs of a ladder. There's not a rung there. And so electrons don't make change and they don't take extra energy and just take part of it. The photon has to be exact. And so when we see all of those different spectral lines in a um, pattern, what we are seeing is basically all of the possible combinations. I'm going to go back one slide. All of the possible combinations like n equals 1 to n equals 2 or 1 to 3 or 2 to 3 or 2 to 4 and so on. All of the possible jumps, the different lengths of the arrows shown here, are what we are seeing when we either have an absorption spectrum, like all of the left arrows that are um, pointing upwards, or an emission spectrum, like all of the right arrows that are pointing downwards here, the arrows on the right. The most important thing to understand for the big picture understanding is that when we have an electron just doing its own thing, chilling on the ground state, it cannot give up extra energy. The ground state is as low as it can possibly go. It cannot go into the nucleus. And so it just chills out there at the bottom of the ladder. If it goes up the ladder, it has done so because we have given it extra energy. And the electrons are really lazy. They actually want to always be back down in the ground state. So an atom with an electron in any of those upper energy levels is called an excited atom because it has extra energy it doesn't want and is able to emit that energy as a photon and drop back down into the ground state at any time. Now hydrogen atoms produce a specific set of visible line spectral lines, visible light spectral lines, based on where those particular energy levels are. And they're not drawn that carefully in this particular picture from our textbook, the way that a chemist would care about the gaps between these. But if we look at the three arrows drawn here, the purple arrow is representing an electron that has gone back down from n equals five down to n equals two and emitted a photon that would look visibly violet to our eyes. If instead the electron does a smaller jump, it's going to emit less energy. And so it emits a kind of blue-green color if it jumps from n equals 4 down to n equals 2. And then if it emits even less energy because of a smaller gap, going from 3 to 2, it might emit a red line, visibly red to us. Now the transitions shown here are called the Balmer series. We do not need to memorize that name. But what's worth recognizing is these don't go all the way down to n equals 1, which is the ground state. Because if we were talking about the even bigger jumps to go all the way back down to the ground state, those lines have more energy, so much so that they're no longer in visible light that our eyes can see. And we actually have a different name for those. Those are the Lyman series of lines. We don't need that name either. It's not even on the slide. But they would be in the ultraviolet. And so these three lines were actually discovered first by the scientist named Balmer um, because they were visible to him in the lab. Okay, so a question for us to make sure that we're starting to understand some of these really key concepts. Energy is released from atoms in the form of light when electrons do what? All right, so we've paused the video, hopefully. When we read through those, re read through these options, a lot of students tend to um, get hung up on, okay, 
energy being released means it's being emitted, and so they choose option two if they're not reading too carefully. And that might be you, and that's perfectly fine, right? I'm not there looking over your shoulder to decide if you answered correctly or not. But we need to recognize that it's not the electrons themselves that are being emitted. It is photons that are being emitted when electrons go from high up the ladder to low on the ladder. So option five here is the correct one. When electrons go from high energy levels down to low energy levels, they release that extra energy as light, as photons. Now chapter five, not just this, this particular video, but the previous videos as well, there is a lot of new information here. A lot of stuff that maybe is somewhat familiar from previous science classes, maybe it's brand new. And so I want us to recognize that there's a lot of activities we'll be doing to make sure that we feel comfortable with these topics. And there are a couple of supplementary workbooks that have a lot of different um, activities that are useful here. So just be aware of those and um, we will be moving on to the last section of chapter five in the next video, Doppler shift, which has its own activities um, because it is one of the more complex ideas that we have to deal with in chapter five. Up until now, it's just been a whole lot like fire host of, of information. Section 5.6 is the one that takes a lot more critical thinking to understand and not just kind of work with and get comfortable with the way that the rest of chapter five has gone so far. So I will see you in that next video.